الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير المرسلين محمد النبي الأمة وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد يقول الله تعالى في القرآن الكريم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم didn't know who you was صلى الله عليه وسلم okay this is a unique talk today there's no doubt about it it will be surprising to for most of us, but in a way, we will be able to sew this into a nice schematic uh, collage of historical reality. Uh, so this is the uh, presentation and it's called uh, Anticipation and Expectation Number Two. I want to just briefly go over some of the early history. Brief early history, we're there in Oakland just going to work. We didn't get out of the pen at 20 years old and we got a good, what they call a good job, you know, working in a, a factory like, you know, and making what in those days was reasonable salary, especially you young and uh, you're able 20 years old, no way and you're not married, you're still staying at home, and it's fine because everybody else done left home. If you're the youngest, everybody done left, so you ain't going nowhere because you got the whole spot by yourself. So you got it, it's a bird nest on the ground as far as you're concerned. So anyway, uh, then we're nice young guys, you know, lifting weights, doing a little boxing, and uh, the sister may consider it kind of like gang activity. By the time 66 rolled around, this is 65, going into 66. By the time 66 rolled around, the Black Panther Party has started downtown. I mean, down in West Oakland on the other side of town. Uh, or North Oakland, whichever one you want to call it. Uh, then that environment of the 60s, uh, the mid 60s is powerful. And you have to realize where we're living. We're living in the cornerstone of America at that time. San Francisco on one side. Greatest song in 66, if you go to San Francisco, I don't know if y'all ever heard that, wear some flowers in your hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, uh, there's going to be some beautiful people there, gentle people there. This is white kids. They don't want to bother. They don't want to be bother nobody. They don't want to be bothered anymore with that historical stuff their parents was doing. And one of the big cornerstones is they're non-racist. They're what you might call the hippies. You know what I mean? They they just. Uh, Free love, you know, love conquers all, uh, drop a little acid, you know. Well, drop a little acid is what the white folks put on them. Ali Stanley was big. See, LSD didn't become illegal till 1966. The only ones that experimented with LSD was 19, it was uh, the U.S. Army. In 1961, they got people jumping out of uh, buildings and stuff like that, they know what acid to do, okay? Long story short, you go across the bay and you meet, reach Oakland. Oakland is now a black city. Oakland is a center everywhere you look. It was Oakland. For a small place, Oakland, why is something? It just was uniquely located in the whole scheme of things during that time. Then you go right next door to Berkeley. 64, the free speech movement, Mario Savio, and all the radical white kids coming out of Berkeley. 
You got to remember the Bay Area, and it's not a big place either. Just imagine San Francisco, go across the Bay to Oakland, then go next door to Berkeley. You got the whole 1960s rolled up into one. The dreams of the white kids, right? If you go to San Francisco, the signal, the sign is wear some flowers in your hair. Can you imagine? This is like what they're really, where they're coming from. Their songs, everything, you know, say that. The Negro in Oakland migrated from the South. And our parents were very Southern. But us, we was all 1960s. One Negro can whoop five white boys without even trying. This was just the way we thought. And it had some reality to it, you know, from those days. Okay. Then next door, the one challenging the system from the white clad. This is organized challenge now. It's not we want to go build a commune in the woods. We just want to be happy. The Berkeley is a legal, a psychological, and an ethical challenge, right, from those white kids to the system. And when I went to jail, that People Park demonstration, uh, Lawrence was one of the white police that, that was beating them white kids to death. But he was fine with me. A lot, the police, the, the, the sheriff, you know, like when you're doing a little time for a week, stuff like that. You get to know all of these guys. And you read the newspaper, you say, oh, Lawrence, he is beating them white kids out there. But with us, it is fine. Why? Because we wasn't a challenge yet to the system, but them white kids, they were, hey, we done worked hard for this. We didn't put this thing in place. And we're not going to let you uh, snotty-nosed brats blow this whole thing. Have y'all ever saw the, the, the killing uh, at Kent State? The white boy laying out on the ground and the white girl just, what is, they were just shocked. You know, what, you know, that mean that, hey, we're not, putting up with you guys. You know, and like the white kids told us after that, some of them, they say, you guys got a big fight coming. In other words, we clipping off our hair, some of them. Some of them went underground and became more radical, but most of them clipped that hair off and got their suit and ties and joined that back up. They said, look what they'll, see, because then it, it wasn't real. It wasn't, you know, we just, Ah, oh, little tear gas run up and down the street. It's like a party almost. Well, you know, it's the, it's the thing. It's the happening. There's something happening here. Things ain't exactly clear. A gun with a man over there. Man with a gun over there. You know, all of that. That's the music. It's a happening. When they saw that boy laying out, Dead, four dead in Ohio. Oh, wait a minute. Four white kids shot dead in Ohio, Kent State? Oh, no, there's something going on here. Uh, I got to pick up the pace because uh, 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 it's easy to get stuck, so bear with me. Uh, okay. The police come by and they said, so they influenced me to get in dealing drugs, or my best friend, start dealing drugs, because we don't want any more little black leaders around. Especially, I just come from the pen and, and that black consciousness, you know, that Nation of Islam stuff, you know, black man is God, white man is the devil. They didn't want that to spread around. And everybody knew me in East Oakland as a Muslim. Man, Big Hank left, and they didn't know what was wrong with me. They said, Man, it can't hard to be around him. He don't drink no more. When I left, you know, before we, we was partying, we first, before we started partying, we used to call it guzzling. Guzzling is you, you learn how to drink wine that you can open your throat 
and it'll go down, glug, 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 glug. Y'all never heard, okay. White port and lemon juice, you never heard of that stuff, huh? White port, okay. Do you remember the movie Panther? Anybody remember? Do you remember the Negro with a rag around his head is pouring a little bit of, out of the wine bottle and then they're on a the basketball court, then he's pouring something down in it. That's lemon juice, we used to call it WPLJ, white port lemon juice. So you, we used to take that cheap wine and put a can, a little can of lemon juice in it for some reason. Anyway, when we went out and partied, when I left in 62, shoot, the way we'd get started at night was take a, a, a fifth of a wine, glug, 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 and you had to kill it all. Oh, you didn't uh, stop drinking a sip. It's called guzzling. You know, you open your throat, you can actually do it. Some people could guzzle a half a gallon. Glug, 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 glug. I was pretty good. I could guzzle a fifth easy and could just about knock over, you know. So that's how we got started partying. You know, on Friday night, you know. Now I come back from the penitentiary, I don't eat no pork, this is unbelievable. Not only I don't eat no pork, I don't eat no meat. I don't drink no wine, I don't drink nothing. I don't even smoke cigarettes. So people thinking I became a monk or something, they didn't, they knew what it was about. They, anyway, but the police saw it as, this is a bad, if everybody in the neighborhood know this guy, this is a bad sign for us. And if rebellion is coming, it's even worse if he don't have bad habits. If people and a lot of people around him was adopting them habits. Man, I'm going to try not to eat no meat. See what happened. I don't believe I live. I think I die. I know I die, but I'm going to try it anyway. No poking beans either. Man, what's beans without poke? You know, and, and it was serious. So anyway, the way you got to look at the way boss man is thinking. So he's going to divert me, and he did. I told you how they did it. They diverted me into selling marijuana. And I was a good businessman, so I got big. Then even bigger. And my friends all worked on a job, so I was by myself all day, just making money, riding around to each corner, you know. And actually, I wanted my friends to be free, too. <laughs> right, you know what I mean? That's technically the reason that I started that East Oakland Enterprises, that being a black economic enterprise zone. So I wouldn't have to be by myself. I could, uh, one day one of my friends worked at Sherman Williams, the paint company, and uh, he just was off that day and w w was riding, I had him riding, and we went over to San Francisco, then we went to, uh, down the Samate, whatever, over the three bridges ride. You go Bay Bridge, then there's another San Rafael Bridge. And then we, you got to go across the Golden Gate, went through Sausalito. You know, it used to be an artist community, white folks on the side of the hill. I don't know what the heck it is now. It's just went crazy. But anyway, so he asked me, do you do this all the time? And I thought about it, yeah, this is my lifestyle. I do this, I go all over, I just do this all the time. This is what I do. And he went to work every day. So he got off Saturday and Saturday, they cut the grass, they do something. And Sunday they just rest, watch football, whatever they did, it wasn't, you know what I mean? They said, and that happened, that was happening all the time. I was, I had another friend and uh, it got late at night. We stopped at the restaurant and uh, he was just one of my friends, you know, like, and uh, I just said, no, get what you want to, da, 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 da. And uh, what am I all restaurant all night, probably Denny's or something like that. And uh, he asked me the same question. 
because it's late at night, you know what I mean? And they had to go to bed so they could get up and go to work. Do you do this same question? Do you do this all the time? I said, yeah, I do this all the time. I get what I need all day, do, 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 and, you know, get money mainly. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so your time is your time. And you got to imagine that at that period, that's rare. You, where you have your own time to do what you want, and it's paying for itself very well because you're driving brand new cars, so it's all right. That was the reason we started East Oakland Enterprises. Now, I'm going to skip ahead. Here come the mean old white man. He don't like that. So he's going to take you to jail all the time, da -da 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 -da, on and off and on and off. And we would got really organized in Oakland. So this mean old white man is actually going to take our empire away. You know, this is, our, this is, you know, basically, you know, when you get to be a big Negro, this is my town. You know, well, that's what, you know. That was just a feeling, and you know, this is my town. You know, what are you talking about? And then he has that authority. And he begins to bear down on you 10 times as much as the Black Panther Party. At the same time, the Black Panther Party is having a lot of trouble. Anyway, we lead a country. When we lead a country, we go to Africa, we go, we really, it's an eye opener. It's just a big eye opener. You have a good idea, uh, but you be start becoming international. And like uh, Dr. John Brannion said, he said, he said, you know, Hank, that uh, we're getting the, the whole uh, education of Africa just by doing what we was doing. And it's, plus, he spoke French. When he was in Algeria, I used to look at him and say, Doc, how you, because he would be my interpreter most. You know, Dr. John Brannion, y'all saw his name. He was, the, he was with his friends with Johnson Publications and all them the Negroes of that era. Yeah, he was at the big, he's the first big Negro doctor and you look at his name, he's chief resident in Chicago, you know, he was big for them. Of course, he killed his wife, you know, that's what he, he said he didn't do it, of course. Somebody said they even had a program on that, I don't know, I, didn't, I, I never saw it, that it was some, some program, anyway, Doc was really educated, but Doc didn't have no gangster game. He didn't have no, he was just educated, you know what I mean? I remember we was at the Cairo Hilton when we was going from Algeria to Tanzania, and I was telling him, Doc, I remember clear, so when we get to Tanzania, we're gonna get organized, and once you get organized, you begin to like a planet, at the, holds gravity and the way things revolve around a planet is we get organized where we're going, everything is going to begin to revolve around us. And he looked at me, he said, you don't even have a PhD. He was thinking this nigga is talking about using real visual about organization. I knew about that. I didn't have to have no, I said, Doc, not only I don't have no PhD, hell, I don't even, even know what the damn thing is. <laughs> At that time, I didn't. I knew it was some certificate or something, but I didn't know exactly what it was, what you had to do to get it. I said, no, Doc, I don't have one. But he was thinking, the stuff you're talking, you have to have a PhD to understand that structure and organization. Anyway, long story short, we learn about Africa. Then we want to help the movement even more than we was already doing. When we go to South America, forget about Europe, Scandinavia, we learn a lot there too. One of the biggest things is how good real Danish pastry is. You know, when you stay up all night and the bakeries open up at four or five in the morning, 
And I'm not talking about this stuff here. These are not Danish pastries. I don't care what you call them. But the Danish pastries in Denmark. Good God Almighty. You had to control yourself. No, because you'd just be fat as a house. You know what I mean? But anyway, and the big bakeries right there on what we used to call, excuse me, like Pussy Ali. You know, a lot of the pimps and things, they hung right out on uh because there was a lot of that stuff going on in Denmark. You, you may not know it, but anyway, so you start acquiring knowledge which is more universal. In, in, in Colombia, I'm going to just skip to Colombia. Colombia and Mexico, we started, you know, I guess the first and last African-American cartel for smuggling cocaine. I, we actually did it. And uh, so, but we knew something by then. I knew everywhere I went. When I was in Denmark, there was a police here from Oakland. It was uh, the same guy that called me on the phone the other, on my birthday. And I hadn't seen him since 1971. And he called me on the phone. And, yes, I said, I said, remember me? I'm the. I said, yeah, we traveled. Your parents was in the, and one was in the army, the other was in the air force. We stayed on the base down in Mannheim, Kaiser Slaughter in K Town, they used to call it. So I remember it all very well. And he started mumbling off some places. He wasn't pronouncing Bukuramiji, which would be really Bukuramunga down in South America. Yeah, I was here and I was there, which he hadn't, wasn't there. I guess he sounded like a kind of like a wino, you know, on the phone. So actually, you know, when the police have an agent, after they finish with them, they throw them out and they don't, and they, half of them just be, anyway, long story short, we picked up on everywhere I went, I was already on boss man's top of the list for some reason. In other words, somebody was feeding boss man information and that information was saying, keep your eye on this guy. And everywhere I went, whether it was Peru, whether it was Bolivia, whether it was Colombia, and, and they, after, first I was just going on my own. So I said, well, let me see. In those days, everybody thought cocaine came from Peru. But I went right to Peru, and they say, if you want a better price, you have to go next door to Bolivia. Technically, Bolivia was the cheapest place at that time, one kilo in Bolivia. This is just the price I would pay. Well, it was about $2,000, pure cocaine in Bolivia. That was, wasn't bad at all, you know, like... Uh, they would say here 40 uh, uh, ounces, but in down there it would be 35 point something other ounces. Anyway, so technically uh, the police was everywhere and they, everybody knew what I was doing because what's the black person doing here? So the police sent people to send me, hey, go up to Columbia. If what you're doing, you go up to Columbia. I got friends there. Now remember, in those days, Colombia was not the spot that it is now. Bolivia and Peru was. So I went to Colombia, got busy, and I would stumble into everything that I wanted. I'd be walking down the street and uh, a uh, black guy would stumble up to me that's going to college down there and hey, da 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 da. Oh, I have friends from Canada. They own a nightclub over here. And uh, you like the cocaine stuff? They have it. So, automatic hookup. Then one of the guys would run off from the Nazis. Th these is Jews, by the way. Not that that have anything to do with it, but. Uh, one, the old one, uh, run off from the Nazis back in the old days. 
And by the way, everybody that lost World War II was in Bolivia, places like that. The Japanese was there growing nice crops. Uh, the Italians and the Germans. Believe it or not, when I was coming across on a boat from, from, uh, uh, from Bolivia, there's a big lake up there, highest lake in the world, Lake Titicaca, 12,500 feet. And it, it, you, it's Peru on one side and Bolivia on the other. And remember, whenever some, I would, I'm the luckiest guy in the world because whatever I'm thinking about, boop, it pops up. So here's a white boy on the boat with me. And he's, at that time, there's a, do you remember they used to have these Nazi hunters? And they would find somebody in Argentina, Bolivia, all in South America. At this time, the white folks, the Jews was looking for a big escape Nazi. Now this is 71, 70, early 72. This is years after all that stuff that happened. And so the white, the white boy is telling me, he said, he says, see that crew there? I said, yeah. He said, that's, and you could tell, that's a German tourist group, a group of German tourists. And they say what he was telling me, and he had to know what he was talking about. He say, you're here on the news, they're looking for that Nazi. He says, zoop, they drop one off, pick him up and take him on where they want to. The tourist group, you see what I mean? It is true. So you get a chance to get involved in you be checking all that stuff out. I'm gonna try to pick it up because I, I gotta tell what I'm really here to talk about. Long story short, we get big down there in South America and Colombia, and we go through all the changes that we go through there, and we get organized, and the people that is providing us with almost everything that we're getting is the government, the United States government. They're providing, you know, the connections, remember, I'm strolling down the street. How am I going to be strolling down the street all the time? It happens now, right now. It happens today, all the time. <laughs> so anyway, I'm strolling down the street, and uh, before I know it, I got the best connections in Colombia. I got perfect connections. Okay. Anyway. We get all that stuff wrapped up. And at the time we're studying the revolution and all that. Long story short, we decide to come back here and fix up our cases and everything. We go to prison, we do this, that, and other, but we got the game. We told you the period of 1970s was like what we call wandering in the wilderness, but it wasn't wandering. It was like figuring out what you're going to do. In 1980, we get out of March 1980. Some of the lectures I gave uh, last month was from those outlines from 1980. Then all of a sudden, I had to return to prison for 14 months. I might have shown y'all some of the paperwork where they said you did such and such and such and we don't want you going back out there and starting your Muslim church. Do y'all remember, anybody remember that? The paperwork, yeah, the, uh, it was uh, right there. Okay, yeah, you, you could read it, yeah, okay. Well, wh why they don't want me to, you know, what's the big deal? But that's the whole thing. I came right back out and got started. Why did I go back in 1980 for no reason? It was because although I came back out and started the masjid in 1980, 
on all the program I was thinking about. And it was a good program. I, I got out and uh, after a couple of months I went back. And I came out 14 months later. What did I do during that 14 months? I had had experiences right away, as soon as I got out. And I had to hook up a broader program. Remember, when I come out, I got global game. I mean, that's just the way it is. I'm not bragging, I'm just saying, I have global game at that time. So I had to have a deep program. We got busy. So we knew we was gonna deal with certain things. Infiltration, sabotage, women, stuff like that. Now, there's no eligible bachelor that's running 10 miles a day and in perfect health that's gonna stay away from women for no 15 years at the height of this, not a Negro. I, did, I have known any. Why? Because that's the main thing they was trying to use, women. And I mean, in those days, it would be, since they think Negroes like white women, they'd have white girls. And in those days, healthy white girls, the white girls now are healthier than they, what we call healthy. In those days, white girls had a flat behind. You ever see the movies from the 50s? How white women, they called Marilyn Monroe healthiest thing in the world. Marilyn Monroe is 22, 36, 20. That was her measurement. 22 inch waist, 36 behind, and 36 up there. And all the girls running around. The white girls now are healthy looking. I mean, they got their body parts fit together perfectly. And by that 80s, they're getting ready to do that, and they always thought the Negro. In fact, the farther you go back, the bigger role a white woman would play in a Negro's life. If you, had, if you was even macking and you had a few good-looking white girls, you'd be the baddest mac in town. That's just, you know, you'd be big. And uh, if you, you know, that was big. So they figured we just have white girls calling in the middle of the night doing that, do, 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 no action at all. That means I should get the Negro uh, Humanitarian Award or something, right? Tell the truth, from those days, I'm not talking about now. Now on TV, every commercial is a, a black man and a white woman or right, or all the yellow kids running around, right? Everything is mixed now. I even saw a Negro with a Chinaman on the TV, right? That, you see the commercial about the car, say, the, buy a car, right? And it's the, the Negro with a, now Asians don't always marry Negroes. They might now, but they sure didn't then. And even now, anyway, I don't want to get into it. I'm going to get to what I want to talk about. 1980s was the age of discovery. So when we start coming in contact, I showed y'all some of the little schedules I would have for a few days, and it was boom, 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 boom. This city, that city. That was all during the 80s. The 80s was a time when Islam was, was beginning to grow and uh, the chief was in big in the 1980s, but he was making a lot of mistakes. Uh, not mistakes, he just didn't know what to do. And the chief come out of the nation of Islam And he didn't have the same view of black people that we might have had. In fact, he had a very 
from what he saw, if anybody would have been in Chicago during his lifetime watching the Lamb and all those ministers, this is the most corrupt bunch of criminals you've ever seen in your life. It's bad, it's worse than what Malcolm was saying. Malcolm was, he, you know, but it was worse than that. Now imagine Imam Warthadine Muhammad seeing that. He's not going to have hope and enthusiasm for those kind of things because he's it's too saturated. The reason he made the this, this decisions he made, because it was saturated with them Negroes, the ministers, the captains, all of them. Hey, they was talking about the teachings, boy, but they wasn't practicing it. And then the prison house was full of us. McNeil Island, the whole California crew that was up on McNeil Island that we had supported. See, if you want to find the, the people that helped the nation grow, it was us. The big money we was making, the hustlers. We, we had black consciousness. We was helping the nation. We was helping. You see the big mosque pop up. Boom. It was that cash money. And I had a feeling I didn't really know it in that depth till I was up on McNeil Island and all the brothers who <laughs> was in the penitentiary and we was all in the nation and we talking, yeah, man, we did this, we did that. I said, well, I did too. I did this, I did that. And I said, man, all of us is here in the penitentiary. Anyway, the long story short is 1980, we get out. 1981, we got to get busy. We knew the patterns of the white man's behavior. So what are we going to do? We're going to take advantage of everything the white man thinks about us. We're not great strategic thinkers. We don't have longevity. That's so why we always say 95% of ability is stickability, right? We can't stay focused that we can get misled easy. Women, drugs, all that will mislead us. Or we can't hold it too long. That's his view of us. That, that's his view, okay? So we have to play on that. What does he think about niggas? So what we did was, not what we did, what I'm gonna say is there are many people involved in this. I might have got the ball rolling But after getting the ball rolling, uh, this is in other people's hands, and you'll see what I mean in a minute. For instance, we have to try to, we got to be here a while. We got to be organized. We got to have strategic brilliance. But it has to be simple for anybody to see. That's what strategic brilliance is. It's if you want to hide something, hide it in a book, or hide it in the open. Uh, and if people want to understand what they're looking at, they can be looking at it and they won't see it. It's called a scotoma. Anyway, so what we did was I give you an idea of, let's call him the New York Imam. I wish, uh, that's why I wanted uh, to be able to verify it. Ayub to be here. At GW, the New York Imam gave a talk over there. 
And then there was this guy, Estes Day. I don't know if y'all ever seen Estes. Big old white boy, you know. Anyway. So when I came in, uh, the Negro imam who was speaking to all the foreign kids, this might have been around 20 years ago. When I walked in and for God and them, all the brothers was there. They heard it. So if you want to double check, you just. So the New York imam says, oh, my imam, Imam Musa. He says, my imam. Then uh, he's almost talking to me from the stage like, uh, man, that stuff you told me about. Uh, uh, and he was on a dope busters team for a while. Dope busters. You know, trying, they was using him to counter me. We had all our things, lectures on drugs, drugs, who's the real, all that. That's what we do. So four or five years later, they got him on that. So he's on that and uh, these are all college kids, to tell you the truth. This is, I love college kids. So anyway, but they're all the system is not that bad. We need to get in there. It was nineteen eighties, early nineteen eighties, and we need to make it work. And I didn't told them, I'm sorry, it ain't gonna work. But anyway, it takes time. This is where patients come in. So anyway, those people have to be educated. That was a lecture at Stanford about that time before he said that. And I brought all the Oakland crew out. Stanford is just a short drive from, not a short drive, but 45 minutes, something like that. And I went over. We went over and he was speaking there. We was showing him support, you know, speaking to the foreigners. So they had made him extra famous with this dope busting. And he was saying how well it was working, something like that. And so his challenge for me was, well, Imam Musa, how many people uh, did you take to Hodge that was past drug dealers? I said, absolutely none. I said, I have a little effect because everybody knew what I was doing in Oakland, so it has an effect on the whole system, but there's no number. Anyway, I did mention to him, I said, uh, uh, for instance, there's four drug teams in the LA Sheriff's Department. One of them is under indictment and all of them are under investigation. Of course, a month later, they was all uh, unindicted. This is LA. That was just for distributing drugs, not the big dope dealer down in South America is bringing all the dope here to destroy black people. This is just the sheriff's department. Them niggas making us so much money that we're going to start robbing them. The sheriff. We're going to start robbing them. We're going to start, you know what I mean, dealing dope ourselves. You know, uh, and Oakland, all the cities is famous in those days for stopping a little black guy. He got $1,200 on him. They keep their money and get on out of here. You know, what are you going to do? Go tell the white folks, hey, they took my money, $1,200. Then, then you got on some tennis shoes and stuff, they're going to say, well, you get $1,200, Nick. Right? So you can't say nothing about it. I'm going to get back to this point, and I'm going to go on and say in words what I've been beating around the bush at. We had to structure a system that uh, different people are going to play a part in this. 
Okay. Now, if you take the Negro imam from New York, when, though, when Negroes from his crew came here, as soon as they would get here and I would see where they was from, I would raise the temperature on talking about the Negro imam from New York to make that guy mad. Some of them couldn't stand it. They'd get up and walk out. Okay, it's okay. Why? Because they believe, number one, Negroes can't get together. Negroes have a leadership problem with each other. And the first thing that I told one of our friends, uh, you might call him a general, and my thing with him was, you can't fight the last war. I, the, the state I was saying was, generals always fight the last war. So in the Gulf War, number one, 91, they had to be extra tough because they had got run out of Vietnam and they was fighting that war back then. You know what I mean? They were still fighting the Vietnam War. And then they was fighting it out in the open. They couldn't hide amongst the trees. There wasn't no trees in Iraq. And they could just mow them down. And then they said the Vietnam Syndrome is dead. That means the generals, that means the captains who was now colonels, and the colonels who are now generals was fighting that war. This is a statement and it's common the generals fight the last war that they was in. It happens with some of our leaders. One of our leaders who we all know, mine was fighting the last war. The 60s, the civil rights, he was fighting that war. In his behavior, if you talk to him, he wouldn't say nothing about COINTEL program. He wouldn't say nothing about this, although we talked and he said, it ain't none of these people with me. So that put a type of, uh, we called it uh, suicidal heroism, if anybody remember that statement. This is type of, you can't, just say, I give up, I quit. But you do something that causes you to get in a certain situation where you're relieved of the leadership responsibility of doing something because you blocked your mind and you don't see any way out of it. Well, we've never been like that. We always knew there's blind spots. I'm going to pick it up. And basically what we did was we worked together, different parts. The New York imam, their job is to move into the spot where, you know, the famous, I was kind of famous amongst the students and all that. So he would move into that. His job would be always be against Imam Musa. Always. And everybody else, too. That's why everybody, how is it that everybody is against Imam Musa, right? I mean, what, no friends? Right? How does that happen? It's by design. Remember, write your own history. Why do you think we talk about write our own history all the time? Because we're confident. We've already written the history. Everything that's happened in the last 30 something years have been by design. It was their job. Different parts. You have to play the part that you're designed for. Their students, they've been to school 
if one of the guys been to Cairo University, uh, well, not Cairo, American University in Cairo, that means he, he's a police automatically. So we got to convince him or them that you, it would be more beneficial to yourself, to your people, to a whole history to participate in this. Participate in what? You do everything you're told by the system. Everything. And when they tell you, stay away from Imam Musa, you stay away from him. When they tell you to cut Imam Musa's throat, right? When they say it's time for you to form a new organization called MANA or what have you, you form it, and what's the goal? To have a regional uh, African-American or institutional setup where, guess what? It deals with America, not the immigrant community, right? That's MANA, Muslim Alliance of North America. And it's only for Americans, but Imam Musa is not in it. And Imam Musa can't even talk at none of the programs. Can't even open his mouth. Why? By design. By what design? If everybody followed, my goal is to do one thing, not one thing, several things. My goal is to challenge the system my goal is to educate people on what the system is. My goal is to teach and train the people on all the possibilities. My goal or my job is to wake everybody up on possibilities and teach people you don't have to be afraid of boss man. Why would that be my job? Because I've been doing it all my life naturally. So they come out of school. They couldn't do it. They wouldn't even know what to do but they would know what to do if boss man hit and they there now we are writing a new script and everybody has a part to play in that each one of them have a specific part to play and i have a part to play right okay That means we're going to fool the system and they're going to do exactly what we expect them to do, anticipation and expectation. If we know the game, we're going to anticipate them. But they don't think we're going to anticipate them on that level. That's why when I went back to jail for 14 months, after coming out and opening the masjid, bam, I look and it's by some <laughs> great plan upstairs that I go back for nothing. But I have time to plan with what I've seen. I've mentioned to y'all that 1982 was a big year for us, 1982. That was when we, uh, if anybody remember the masjid in Denver. And the masjid in Denver was, it, for us, it was the World Trade Center 93. That was the game that we had. Believe it or not, we had bought the masjid in Oakland in 81, but we didn't open until late 82 or something because we're remodeling it, you know, and everything. But Denver, we're traveling and we hit Denver and we opened the masjid in Denver because we got a crew there in Denver. What's happening in Denver? What happened in Denver? And number one, the government came down on us like a ton of bricks. Number one, the Iranian guy 
that was managing a lot of stuff and active and young, da 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 da. They kidnapped him. Who kidnapped him? Some of the same people you see the newspaper down there? Yeah, the same people from whatever ville they call it, right? They was at the meeting over there when we went there. The guy's name was Jelani, right? Who came and destroyed the, the Islamic movement in 19, you take 1981, 82, 83, the, the, the remnants of Islamic movement is destroyed. At the same time, the Islamic party goes overseas because they can't handle the, the hassle that they're getting here. You can all, you can check with Abdul Haq and them, all of that. They're right here in DC. We're studying all of that because we've studied everywhere we go. So we got to do something about this. If 1982 is when we got the, the seal on the game, what did they do in Denver? Um, running down the street in Denver and up pops, remember I'm telling you about up pops people, boy, up pops people. Who has this popped up? Well, just a few months ago when I was in prison, uh, here's a guy from Denver, hey, da 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 da. And he used to come to the Muslim programs all the time, technically a Muslim. He gets up next to me I take him around with me. This is what we're doing here. This is what we're doing there. And pretty soon he gets in with everybody that I'm around. And the guy that's the main mm, foreigner, the main guy, Brother Ali, they sent some Negroes from Carolina and he used to go to the flea market all the time. He had a contract with Radio Shack and he used to get all that equipment and he would go out. You know what I mean? He was a business guy. If you go to, uh, is it Tabriz? If you go to, uh, I'll think of the name. Uh, it's a big city in Northern Iran. He has a big building with his name on it right now. That's what our friends tell us. Yeah. He has, I ain't gonna mention the name, building downtown right now. He, he has that. The Negroes got up close to him from Carolina, named Daoud and all of them. They got, finally they did a little this and, and they got $8,000 worth of equipment and disappeared. At that time, $8,000 was a lot of money. So it, hurt the feelings of the, remember now, Iranians trying to help the Negroes. And if the Negroes get up next to them and they run off, they don't, they run off with it, but it associate us with all of that. The guy that was doing this, he had two attacks. One was the money attack. The next was the guys that had broken away from the Dar, they had camps in Compton, they had camps in Northern California, and they had a camp, they call them extremists, in Colorado. They kidnapped Brother Ali, told him we're gonna cut your penis off and stick it in your mouth if you don't stay away from such and such. Of course he didn't do it, but that's what they was doing. The remnants of the Dar al Islam movement was transferred everywhere and the guy that broke up the Dar al Islam movement came from the crazy house in Saudi Arabia. Well, he was a manager of the crazy house. Psychological, right? They came here, they already had snitches inside of the military arm of the Dar al Islam movement. Everybody except me thought, oh, he just came and worked some magic on the Negroes. That's what they was trying to say. Uh, black magic and all that. I said, there was no black magic. I said, them Negroes, there was a police already in your organization. 
And when he gave the word, because it was a big move, boom, 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 and Yahya Abdul Karim is sitting there one day, the head of the Dal Islam movement, and Sheikh Jelani comes in and say, I'm gonna make you a mirror of Dawa. That's what Suleiman Al Hadi and them told me. Remember, all the pictures of Suleiman, I'm in a day to day contact with the Dal Islam movement in New York, although I'm out in Oakland. You look at the separation. Imam Jamil gets the remnants of Dal Islam movement. Imam Jamil. Good friend of ours, but remember, generals fight the last war in their time. Sometime if you have a general left over, a good general, but what about the mid 80s going into the 90s and all of that, right? What are we gonna come up with? Someone had to come up with a, a pattern of behavior. Number one, Someone is gonna to have to play the bad guy. You be the bad guy. And you're gonna get all the bad guys are gonna stick to you. So if I go to South Africa, all the Paget and all of those gangsters, they gonna be, they gonna invite me there all the time. Cause everybody can, that's, that's, that's not only the role I'm playing, but that's what I am. That's not only the role I'm playing, role I'm playing, that's what I am. If they want to stop our influence in South Africa, they have to import a Negro that sounds like us, da 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 da. So the next thing you see, you'll have what's the one uh, brother from the islands always before Columbus? Uh, Abdullah Hakim Quick. I don't mean to mention names. Of course, next time, now I'm going to mention them. I'm not going to say the New York man. No, because now, this is a, I could just skip and say, what the hell are you talking about? All the stuff we've been doing now for 30 something years have been coordinated. If the New York man was over there, Darl Hidra, raising money for manna, and he tells them, we're all there. Uh, we have a different agenda from Imam Musa. I'm sitting there. Well, I don't say nothing. I said, man, what the hell are you talking about? Well, he raised $36,000 over there just after prayer. <laughs> Fine. Those people are scared, afraid of Imam Musa. He has to let them people know. We don't have... I'm the emir of this group, Mana. And we have a different view on white folks than Imam Musa. Why Imam Musa don't say that? Because that's what he's supposed to do. When he says at GW, oh, my Imam, he has to be corrected. You don't say stuff like that in public. My ma'am, because I didn't prove the point. Remember the thing on drugs? The thing is so clear now, he's saying, hey man, he, here on the stage, he's saying to me, ask, work on, I ask any of them. Ask are you, who's over there at GW? Uh, I have to clarify him without visiting with him or nothing that we are early in the game. This is not time for you to uh, congratulate me. You're against me, and you can't call me your imam in front of everybody, right? You can't do that. His job is to be against me, right? His job and everybody else's. What's happening, been happening here has been the way it's supposed to be. They're supposed to develop. Now think about it. You see what we have here? 
Suppose it was somebody else did the same thing. He would have an empty masjid, just like we do. Right? If they had the same, so we got to have somebody, their job is to go up against boss man and hopefully survive and thrive and everybody else's is to move off and do what they're told. They're going to meet everybody. They're going to know everybody. Right? Everybody's going to love them. They're going to speak on all the programs. Right? If you don't believe it, in 97, Mellow Yellow, I'll tell you who that is, and the nice, at the great white shake. I'll tell you their names in a while. You can figure them out, though. I mean. So the great white shake is from the Bay Area. A nice, soupy guy. You would think he was a super sweetie pie. I mean, and a scaredy cat, white kid. He's not that. He got a lot of discipline, a lot of self-control. That's his part to play that. Some of our Negroes didn't know what was going on. So Mellow Yellow has to come. This is 97. When they have the ISNA program in Chicago. Uh, say, Imam Musa, could we get with you? Uh, and, and we was up like when they have a big, uh, not conference, but the big space where they have all the tables and everything. Then there's an office up there with glass you can see out. We met up in that room. And the idea was for the great white shake to act like a scaredy cat white boy, which he did because the tough guy Negroes that was with me or pretending to be with me was scaring him to death or it shouldn't be no conflict. So I had, I had to come, Mellow Yellow come down, he said, we want to talk to you and I went up there and I told everybody that was with me, I said, you leave him alone. He got a right to do whatever he wants. Well, he's teaching now. I said, I don't care what he's teaching. So that was that. What's happening with uh, the great white shake? The great white shake is either loved or hated all over the world. Because he has to play a part. What part is he going to play? The exact part he's playing as a Sufi and since he's white, if you're white, you're all right. That means the white folks is going to drool at the mouth at him. They're going to drool at the mouth. There ain't nothing you can do about it, right? If I go to Sri Lanka, do you know the great white shake? I say, yeah, we're from the same area. Or if I go over here and he's talking uh, at one of the big shows over here, yes, uh, I go running in the mountains every day. You know, everybody know I go running in the mountains. At least I did, you know. And you don't go running, in the, you don't, not enough. You don't even live in the mountains. The, the, there's a few hills over there, but it ain't no whole. Anyway, if we're going to affect the world, we have to have a world-class organization. And it's gonna have to touch every base. Every base, not just one base or two base. Why do we always say it's 10 or 15% FBI agents that are good FBI agents? They, they believe, well, they're constitutional. They believe in the Constitution. When they're oppressing somebody, they don't really want to do it. I say that every other week, right? Okay, that's actually true. That's actually true. The other thing is, we have to have an organization that, uh, why am I saying this now? 
This is a perfect storm time. This is, this, this is not, we done did this for so many years and we in pocket. So now we have to put in place everything we've been working on. Now I gave the signal years ago about Stalingrad to Oakland. That's supposed to be a little signal. <laughs> but I have nobody responded yet. So uh, we give it out again. We have to give, come out and get more and more and more to the point. What's the point? The point is we're at a critical time. This is a perfect storm. Uh, we can't drag our feet right now. So we have to come out and begin to influence the direction of change now. Why? Everything that we said, especially in the last few months, have been so accurate, it's unbelievable. Is that correct or incorrect? incorrect. Including that everything that's happening now is arranged. We said all of that is arranged. When we're downtown and the white boy, yeah, we're saying this is a movie script. This is a script. This is what they're doing. And when people come from Iran on a first class ticket to come over here to convince me of something else, right? That means they whole team. You got to remember, we're here. You got to get used to there's a whole team that's in cooperation and they cooperate and they are against what we're doing. But we have a team too that's been cooperating with them. Our team have been cooperating with them. Cooperate means whatever you're told to do, you do it. You don't say I love Imam Musa, you say I hate Imam Musa. He's a bad guy, we're against that, right? Because it's my job to do what I've been trained to do. Them guys went to school. They have never been brought up in the back room with the white man and nobody's there but they black ass and the white man. What does he do? What do you see in his eyes, you right? They ain't never seen it. They may say, well, we'll work within the system, but you know that ain't working. It ain't gonna work. Then when they bring, and then you study a system, sabotage, subversion, destruction, and then when they bring the Zionist in, the Zionist killings are the type of killing, they're killing Negroes like they killed Palestinians, with no feeling, with no nothing. Look at all the killings. Recently, I mean, uh, George Floyd, they just got his hand on his knees there, man. They ain't moving around, ain't nothing. It's just like he's not even human. He's, the man is not human and the police ain't human. And I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing anything, right? So he's trained to act that way. The police gear, the police weapons, everything now is being formed under Zionist control. Everything that Donald Trump was doing is to favor the Zionists. The last treaties they're having with certain countries, right, Arab countries, are to favor the Zionists, and it's against the Palestinians, right? Everything that's happening in America. Two hours ago, Barr said that uh, these uh, lockdowns would be the same as slavery. What's the name was down there a few hours ago, O'Don, talking about slavery. Right down there, I forget the name of the thing. He's right downtown. Why is this a perfect storm? It's a perfect storm for several reasons. Number one, it's a great period of opportunity, but it's a great period of danger. We got to get involved in this where we have some authority because the, the meanest people in the world 
are directing this. And if they're 30% successful, hey, that's pretty bad. When we're no percent successful, now, don't worry. We got everything going our way. The whole world, we prayed, oh, a lot, run these people crazy, make a fool out of it. Guess what? Everything Don say, the man is crazy. His whole administration is falling apart. Some guy, Kapuru, I don't know whatever his name, he said, uh, you got to get some guns. Right, did y'all hear that? And, and they trying to get me, right? Whatever's going on in the, they, they going crazy. They didn't already went crazy. Even when they wasn't playing crazy, now the stuff, the Zionists, trying to follow the Zionists, the Zionists and run them crazy. I'm telling you right now today, everything they say, and they're tearing down our statues, Da, 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 da. That's what the, this is an hour ago, bar. If they're even partially successful, they will change the whole narrative that the boogeyman is the Negro. He's the problem. It makes no difference whether the black woman, uh, uh, the brother that was not killed, but he was shot in was not Wisconsin, whatever, Kinsho, Kosho, whatever. Wisconsin. Think about it. She said, I pray for my son. I pray for the people. I pray for y'all. And I pray for the police. What she said. They don't put that on TV hardly at all. All they put on is you'll see some Negro arguing with white people to sit down at a restaurant or something, sitting outside. And they'll say, these are the type of people that are trying to destroy America. That's they white folks. That's they niggas, in other words. All them people burning. How is it that everybody, every family, right, say we want nonviolent demonstrations, right? And when they're there, they didn't got it down so pat that they don't be no violence when they're marching. But as soon as the sun go down, all them bums come. And they blame the dumb white folks allow the system to say that we got to law and order those people and those people are the demonstrators. They're not the demonstrators and everybody know it. And the news do not report it correctly. The news should say over and over again that all of the people that's been really injured, they are nonviolent. Those people that's coming, causing the trouble, are your problem. They're a police problem. Right? We're not the problem. And we got to collect support the police, support the police my behind. And one brother said, we just don't want to get killed, that's all. We don't want to be shot and murdered. And it's okay, right? <laughs> that's basically all we say. We don't want to get murdered. We don't want a police saying, gun, and everybody, and I get 40, 25 bullet holes and something, astronomical number, right? And it's okay. All right. That's why our period, our time in Denver was a period of discover, discovery where we got the pattern of the visible tactics that would be used against us. In those days, it was either kidnapping and all those other things, diverting uh, our wealth, the destruction of the Dar al Islam movement. Why would we, y'all bear with me while I, because uh, I'm coming out part here, part there. You know, in the pyramids, they had, uh, you know, those pictures you would see in the pyramid, 
that the king of the Pharaoh was born, and he grows up, right? He marries a beautiful princess. You know, it's all on the wall, already drawn. It's a storyboard, already drawn out there. And he gets married, and he uh, has many wars, which he wins all of them, right? Then he dies, and he goes across on the boat to the other land. That was not drawn after he died. It was drawn before. They drew that as soon as he was born. Why? So he could see what his life is going to be like. Do you notice we always talk a lot about storyboard, writing your own history? The Negro has pulled the greatest turnover in history right here. What, we've already done that. And here we have. We have done it with expertise, without no reason to be jealous. You're not the leader. I'm not the leader. We're a, a, a cooperation of people, of actors that have different parts. We're all actors cooperating with each other and playing a part. If you go and talk to thousands of people, da 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 da, and I get beat upside the head, I can't be jealous of you because I'm doing my part. Right? If you're going to make a good show, Suppose you start arguing with the guy, the guy that's a star. You get all the women, man. Then I'm playing the nigga, you know what I mean, that's carrying your suitcases around. I don't want to play that part. But you may get an Academy Award for the best supporting actors, right? Had the McDaniels and, and Gone with the Wind got the, the, the support. She was the greatest they thought she almost should have won the Academy Award. She did win one for a supporting actress, right? And then when you get up and watch her talk, I said, man, that lady is educated. That, edu that, edu that woman ain't no nanny, right? But she played a good part. You know, the Negroes used to tell her, man, you playing old stepping foot, you know. He's... So they said, I would rather play a maid for uh, $700 a week, that was a lot in those days, than to be one for 70 right? <laughs> in other words, <laughs> it's simple. Okay. So far, we've done very good. Everybody has played their part. I don't know who all the people are involved with because with the heat factor, after I talk to, let's say, the New York imam and a couple of more uh, different places, I have to leave it alone. That's why in 1988, we've talked about this before, I can be in front of everybody at ISNA headquarters all Negroes, all imams, and they all turn their back on me. They all turn their back. If you come lying, Fareed Newman has the film of that. Fareed Newman's in Philadelphia, used to work for AMC, American Muslim Council. As a collector of information, and all other, remember, in those days, they hired all Negroes to do work that they couldn't do. So, it's son Bagby would collect all the information. How many masajid is it? So he'd go around all the country. Fareed Newman was a cameraman. He'd collect, they, those people hired all of us to do their work. We anticipated that. We anticipated that. They should cooperate with them, right? They cooperate with them. They have cooperated, but now 
their program has gone totally flat. The immigrants program. They're whining and crying about Islamophobia, right? Islamophobia, all right. Now it's time to help and aid and assist them from a position of leadership and cooperation. That means that we've always said that we have to have a way to influence the immigrant crowd without running them away. They're not going to listen to me. Or if somebody tell them to, they would. But they already got their Negroes, their professional Negroes. They don't come out tomorrow and say, let's go do this, that. But gradually, they bring out a platform that can give, basically, give Muslims, all of the Muslims in America, a seat at the table. Not directing it to show, but a seat at the table. Okay. Personally, I'm already at the table. Personally, at every table they got. Why you can tell? Because the United States government is mobilized and all of its agents are mobilized to try to stop us from moving forward. They have not been successful. They are not successful. They're just not successful. We're still here. And the people that have been cooperating with them are on our team. We're on the same team. Well, hopefully we're on the same team. Because see, <laughs> to secure your position, you got to make sure you don't have no contact with people for years. And it's all, you know, Everybody have to play their part. Okay, we played our part. And they have played their part. It's very possible they're not the stooges and snitches that we call them. It's our job to call them stooges, stooges and snitches. So they'll be more acceptable. Tattletale, low-down snitches running around, bootlickers, right? So the people will said, he know they, that mean, come on, you with me. You get Musa, you with me. They get in more and they see more stuff. Pretty soon, boss man get loose. You know, when you start taking people for granted, you start getting loose. And they start seeing stuff. They already gonna see stuff, but they start picking up on stuff and they see, they see stuff that they don't even know what they're seeing until you tell them that there's holes in everything. There's Every system that's man-made and human-made, another man can challenge it. So that's our job. Okay, let me try to get a little more specific. Paranoia in the White House. World stage, everyone plays a part. Okay, A. I chose my part. And everybody else accepted their part. The only one, I'm responsible to play my part. So I've been a thorn in the system, punk the white man, this, that, another, teasing him, making a fun of him, and being correct all the doggone time. That's pretty bad. 
Suppose you describing the white man's fall, right? And you're right all the time. That means when we tell them that here's your only way out, boss man, here's what you can do. That means that we're now having some influence on the ones inside that's been there all the time. And they've been paying attention too, very close attention, and you begin to affect them. And so when you say something, they know it's true. You got to do that over and over and over again. They can't do it once in the people. Over and over and over and over again till they know when that nigga say something, it's the truth. Because it always has been. Every prediction, I'll give you an example. In a system that's always heading down, boss man is heading down fast. Boo. Thucydides trap, you know, when one is coming down, one empire is coming down, another is coming up, they always confront. Right now, there is no possibility that America can challenge the Chinese. There is absolutely no possibility. This is just not possible. And it's been like that for a long time. But when you look at the way boss man is surrounded right now, when you look at the boss man management system, the Chinese got five times more people than the United States, right? And they got two or three people in China with the virus. And they started with a virus and they locked it down. This guy here said, we didn't know nothing about it. He started calling it the Hong Kong virus, the Kung Fu virus. And then they come right out on the news and say, this guy was talking with the premier of China for I don't know how long. What did you talk about? We talked about the virus. And it's on the white folks' news all every for the last week. That he knew about this stuff way back when. They say he got the game, full game on this on the 28th of February. And he gave a talking with this guy Woodard, whatever his name is, on the 7th of March. And then on the 19th of March, right? And he always, so he knew all the time. And then whatever he's doing, it's insanity in the White House. They don't even keep up with lies no more because he don't, he, he just, he can say, Don, Don can say, I'm a big time white man. Then he, the people put it on the news. Don said he's a big time white man. I didn't say I was a big time white man. I said I was a big time pale face. That's different. See, the pale face and the white man is different. He'll say that Go right on about his business, right? Like <laughs> The man, look, but this is a good thing, but it's dangerous too. Because see, it's all on us, all these wars in the Middle East, all of what can happen in the United States right now. We have to protect ourselves and our family because if they're partially successful, if the United States... That's why I had you pull up that thing on voting. Remember, I said they want everybody to vote, right? And that's what we said. And then now, two days later, they come out with a movie on voting, right? The black man, they keeping black people from voting. So when they do that, we got to run down there and vote, right? We got to run down there and vote. Okay. We can't leave this stuff to them because if we leave it to them, we're a sideshow. We got to get in there and say, hold it, we're at the table. That's where we're going. We're going to make that move even if we do it by ourselves. We're not going to put up with them people managing our life. They're not 
in control of themselves. So they can't, they don't have a right to manipulate our life, our children, our family. They ain't got the, they, they're at an, an empire when it's on the way down, they're just like a Negro or anybody else. He makes half of the mistakes himself. Right? When you start going down, your wife is with you. You beat her up because she said one word because you're going down. And you run her off. And that's the only friend you had. Right? So you get worse. You lose your house. You lose your car. And pretty soon, you're there by yourself. Okay, if we leave this America to this boss man here, he's going to bring us all down. Now, all the immigrants and the Americans, the Negroes, I don't want to sound like a, <laughs> it's, uh, it's in a way it's sad, but that's the way it is. It's uh, Kingism, Mandelaism, it's a combination of a Tuskegee Airmen, uh, the 369th, you know, that fought in there, right? That here we are, have enough compassion to try to rescue America from itself. Yeah. That's the way it go. That's the way the job, that goes with the job, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> So they give it to Ski to Garm and they medals 50 years, everybody's dead. They, right? Everybody's dead almost. And they go, well, we better give you a medal before you die. The guy come up in a wheelchair. <clears throat> it's okay. We're not doing it for that. But what do we, there's something called history. And history places people and personalities and all the environmental circumstances. Some people are fortunate to get that whole picture and able to stick it together at one time. Okay, I'm not bragging, but I can. I can talk about Japan, China, any, anywhere you talk about, right? With expertise, I mean, just uh, Sri Lanka, anything, it doesn't make a difference. That's a certain gift. Also the timing. The timing is now that we have to arise from our comfort. See, brothers might have got comfort playing that, comfortable playing that part. I'm getting a feeling, I ain't gonna say nothing, but I'm getting a feeling, cause I gave the signal a while back, you know what I mean, that okay. I mean, the signal, this, this is a signal, remember? Stalingrad. The Oakland. They supposed to study what happened at Stalingrad, right? And old Oakland, it was the change in the whole World War II, right? This was the big first big victory, and from then on, it was downhill for the Germans. Okay. So. Maybe everybody got comfortable because that's five, six, seven, eight years old. But uh, so now, but this is an emergency. See, anybody can see this is an emergency, what we're living in. This is not normal. Everything is accelerating and moving at a fast pace. And we're not managing anything. Not only black people, but Muslims, we're not managing anything. That means our life is in their hand. They throw up the sail and catch the wind to go where they want to go. We cannot allow either of these Democrats, Republicans, the system, none of the system, to manage our life. And none of them are even talking about anything that's real. None of them, they're not even talking about it. I'll close in a minute. I'll just repeat this for the next three or four days. I'll go over the same subject over till we get it 
Don't worry. It'll be sunk in. They don't look. No. You can't get all of this stuff. This is 40 years and, and uh, try to get it out. And, you know, you just put... <laughs> no, this is... This is 38 years. This is 38 years, actually 39. Technically, it's 40 years. Yeah, that's what it is. But 38 years of planning and being, having a picture, expectation, what you're going to deal with, right? What we were going to deal with in those days, now we've lived through certain cycles uh, that was before global warming not before it was started already but it wasn't like it is now and nobody talked they not they talk every day oh did you see the fire the fire have hurricanes and you know a fire wind you know the blacksmith thing that puts air on the fire, the fire gets hot, the wind blow on the fire gets hot. And imagine hurricanes, fire hurricanes within a fire. Good God Almighty, that ain't never happened before and everybody, they ain't saying we gotta stop. Look, huh? And the reason that the smoke Uh, the smoke here. This, what do you? Yeah, that's why it was cloudy. It wasn't cloudy. It was way up in the air. That's why it was hazy uh, two days ago. Yeah. No, no. That was the fire. Three thousand miles away. No, it was all on the news. It, They're not, okay, that's what I'm saying is, but this is all real. The stuff in the water, the, all the stuff is real. It's real, real, real. Okay, now, we've already waited on them to do something. We've already been to all boss man. Everybody's voted already. And they're trying to get people to vote again. Why do you think they just happened to come out with this new program? We just, uh, to go vote. Now, we didn't say that a while ago. Why? Because we've studied the behavior pattern of white folks, so it's easy to forecast. It's easy to predict. It's not possible for no Negro to sit down and say every week, one, two, three, four, right? And it comes out one, two, three. It's not possible. It's just not possible unless there's something special going on. Okay? That special thing is us. It's now we have an opportunity to do this type of thing. And we have no niya, no intention, but good. There's no other intention. Okay, some of the people believe it, but there's white folks that don't believe niggas can do anything good. You know, uh, about the Civil War, they say uh, how grand popular uh, President Grant was. He was big on Reconstruction and, and Negroes too. He, you know, for a white man, he didn't do bad. He, he actually, he had a slave and freed it when he was poor. He freed the Negro when he was poor. He, the people at the courthouse were saying, you, you gonna free the nigga? And that was way before, that was when he was a drunk, you know what I mean? He was, uh, Grant was a general. Oh, yeah, he was. A, but that was before he was a general. He, he got out of the Mexican War, and he was farming then and stuff like that. But anyway, uh, General Grant was big all the way up to about 1900. And then you notice in 1915, Birth of a Nation came out. That was the first full-length movie. Birth of a Nation flipped the script where the whole South it was were not bad. It wasn't about slavery, it was about states' rights. And then they showed all these old Negroes 
going to rape white women and stuff. Right? And pretty soon, they showed Negroes almost barefooted. They were barefooted. And stuff like that. And within a few years, they didn't change the narrative to pretty soon find me a street named Grant and find me a street named Lee or a highway called Grant Highway or go find Lee Highway, right? How is it that Grant won, Lee lost? Why is more stuff called Lee than Grant? And it was like that up until 1900. They shifted the whole thing. It's, man, they can shift it. That's what they're doing now. They shift in the, the people demonstrating because they just don't want to get shot. Right? They're the problem. Right? You listen to the, that's what he's saying. Just, the niggas is the problem. We got to keep them in line. Right? We got to keep them in line. And nobody is saying they shoot each other. Sure, after you done brought all them, that they wasn't shooting each other back in the early 60s. They started shooting each other in the 70s after you brought all that dope over here, right? And, and run them crazy and uh, turn them into dummies, right? And now they've been killing each other for the last 40, 50 years because you ran them crazy. But the news, the mayors, none of that, they don't say anything about it. They don't say the reason our crime rate is so high in Chicago and we're killing each other is because of drugs. Because what you brought here, we didn't bring it here. One thing I, you never heard me say, yeah man, when I was in Colombia, I saw a whole lot of niggas down there. When I was in Mexico, even in Mexico, you didn't see no Negroes. <laughs> Everything here came from them people. Okay, so it's time for us to come out of the closet. I'm going to repeat this tomorrow and on Sunday uh, uh, until I say it the way I, I want. I'd like to close. By the way, I paid all the taxes the other day. We thank everybody for participating. And um, I thought about selling that property over there. They, they, they $1,200. One time they had it at $5,000. Uh, we'll sue them when we get ready. But we're not going to sell it. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to start raising funds for our next taxes right now <laughs> right i mean we always been like that pre pre planning but we're going to start raising funds so we will have them ahead of time and we're not going to just stay in here in the house where we're almost broke we're going to go out to everybody yeah uh eventually we'll talk about all the friends that we have gained and all the people that uh have drifted away, and we're also going to talk about just this whole historic period of preparation. We don't believe that Allah allowed us to go through all of this to be passengers on the Titanic. Yeah, we're not. Uh, we're not going to be passengers on the Titanic. Yeah, no, 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 no. We're, we're just not going to do that. Uh, if our brothers have forgotten what our original mission was, first of all, we won that game. We cooperated with each other all those years. We done done that. That's not possible. They don't believe it and niggas can do it. And now all we have to do is <laughs> uh, if people forget and they get to enjoy their position that's up to them we just gonna keep on rolling with what we got uh, we'll uh, mention it a few more times 
If people don't come forward and uh, they can structure whatever they want, we, we should have structured meetings. The phone should be ringing last year saying we're ready to go and uh, what you think we ought to do and we all collaborate. Remember, it's not an individual. We're collective and everybody played a part. Everybody will be recognized if they want it for the part that they play. Of course, for me, I don't need no recognition you know, about none of this. But in case some others do, it's not about the individual. Thing I told Imam Jamil years ago, I said, we need a hundred big niggas, not us one or two, you know. And uh, that's what we mean about fighting the last war where you got one general and you do something to the general and you destroy the whole movement. That's bad planning, right? Tell the truth. That's bad planning and that's not learning. Are there any questions? Yes, yes, yes. I didn't say, go ahead, go ahead. He left, he broke. Yeah. No, he was at the, the masjid there. That was a part of uh, Imam Waritadeen uh, Muhammad's community. Siraj, he made a decision uh, that was not a bad decision. Because if you would remember, 1980, 79, 80, 77. Imam Muhammad was making a lot of decisions that were very close to almost governmental decisions. In fact, those are the years that I left the community. I used to be in the community too. And I left because it seemed that he was moving too slow. I said myself that later on in my progression, I would have stayed in the community, but it was too late because when I saw what he was looking at and understood it from, uh, huh? Yeah, when I understood it from uh, what he, what I'm, when I talk about Imam Muhammad now, you can see that his compassion, friendship, and love, and it was like that before he passed away. We was in Iran together. We didn't been around each other a lot, and it's just fine, okay? But when he was in Oakland, when he left Chicago, he moved to Oakland for a while. And it was some stuff back and forth. But Siraj left for certain reasons. At the time he left, and the job he's done since then, you would think, of course, I didn't mention Siraj's name. I said the New York imam, so I'll go back to that, that I'm technically not talking about Siraj, but as far as the New York imam is concerned, he's played a, a very good part in the last years he harnessed the energy of the uh, immigrants. He helped them build mosques all over the country. Uh, but he's been around so long that he's beginning to feel what we've been telling them all the time. You're valuable as long as you're useful. You got to remember, the immigrant now got tons of kids. They've sent to school. They've sent some to Pakistan. 
They send some to this place, some to that place, right? And that's what they like. They like somebody that studied Islam and they come and they are a preacher with no authority just to preach. They don't want imams like imams like we have. You come up through the ranks and what have you and you have authority in the masjid. They don't, they don't like that. See, their authority, the board of directors and all of their senators, right? They have the authority. You ask anything, you got to talk to the board of directors in our community, talk to the imam. Right? That's the way, and all of us I'm not saying I don't respect the people and sit in a schoolhouse, but if you come up through the ranks, well, you don't know nothing about Salat, you teach a class on Salat, you got to study all the Quran, on how you read every ayat, all the Hadith, pretty soon you're an expert on Salat. On counseling, you got people coming to you every day. You remember my wife said this, he married my husband, he, he got a girlfriend, he said that's a right hand possession, and he, he don't, do he have the right to do that? And you gotta get, become an expert on all of that. But you say, y'all catch me next week, I'll give you the whole spill on that. You go and you research everything. Pretty soon you come back like you knew it all the time. Yeah, da, 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 da. Those are the people, that's when knowledge is real. Not you sit in a classroom, right? Like going to school, ask the kids about something Abraham Lincoln said in his third year as president. They don't even know because they just read it in the book and they, you know, they had to know it for the test. You know where I, they know everything for the test? But after two weeks, they don't know. Oh, all right. So to the question about the northern imam. The northern imam have played a, a real good part and uh, that is if he get on the phone and start calling and, and live up to what we had talked about. Uh, we, we discussed all this. And remember we didn't talk about writing our own history and writing a good part in there for everybody. That's what we were, we've been saying all the time, and now you know what we're talking about. That this thing that we've been dealing with, now we gotta bring it to the forefront. So anyway, uh, Imam Muhammad was a good man. He did a miraculous job. He brought a whole community to, uh, to true Islam. He, he did a, 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 hey, that's, that was his job. That's a bigger, you don't have to do no bigger job than that, right? That's, that's unbelievable. To take a whole group of people that were saying, what is it, a black man is God is a white man. Who is the original man? The original man is the Asiatic black man, the maker, the owner, cream of the planet Earth, father of civilization, and God of the universe. Talking about niggas. Right? I mean, I'm not down on them, but they didn't make the universe. Right? The Negro I ain't did don't make the, the universe, right? And that's what we was taught. Right? And he brought us the La ilaha illallah, Muhammad al Rasulullah. And he brought us the only way he could. He didn't. He didn't have a, it was no outline for that, for that job. You know where you get a job and there's no description, right? He got a job and there's no description. So as long as he get to the right road, he can wander all he want. Cause the chief, I used to, boy, the chief, y'all ain't heard them lectures. Oxygen, water gin, hydrogen, different kind of gins. <laughs> Boy, look at here. Riboflavin, y'all ain't heard all that. I ain't gonna even tell you. Boy, the chief, he was on a roll. <laughs> and so, uh, some of the lectures, you couldn't follow them. 
but he was headed to Islam. Those were real lectures. Sam's son, uh, hydrogen, because he was asked a question about different kind of gins, and he said they got hydrogens, water gin, oxogen, air gin. And look at here. <laughs> ox, take a, a bee, put it on the ox, and you got a box, you got box. And in a boxing ring, you can't do no fouls if you use your thumb. It's a foul in the boxing ring. And a boxing uh, is a mitt, not a glove. It is. A boxing glove is not a glove. Glove got each finger, right? It's a mitt. So you got E mitt and O mitt. And then, uh, I'm just trying to remember this stuff is 50. <laughs> the chief hay man was on a roll. And at that time, you said, I ain't putting up with that chief. <laughs> you got to. I mean, I was in Oakland one time. I don't want to take all your time. We'll pray in a minute. But the chief was uh, given one of them lectures. And, you know, his eyes turned kind of red. I said, boy, the chief just went crazy. But the chief was under pressure. He had a whole community and it had no guidelines. What the hell do I do? Right? You got to think about it. Then as he moved on, he got, he got the feeling. You could tell when he got in stride and he knew what to do. But even think about his titles. First, he was a supreme minister, 75, 76. He was a supreme minister. Then he became, I think, the chief minister. Then he became the Mujeddit, which is a good title, Mujeddit Reviver. Then he became the president. Hey, man, he was on a roll. He, he was on a roll. He, he didn't know what the hell to do. And there was no, how do you get these people from worshiping uh, themselves and somebody crazy at, to worshiping Allah? And he did it. That was a, that's a miracle. You don't need to do anything else other than that. That's a big miracle. With the niggas that was with him, I know a lot of them. Shoot. Hey, anyway. So I hope I answered the question, or part of the question. But Imam Muhammad was a good man, and uh, he did a good job. And the, the minister from New York, whatever his name was, the Imam from New York, he left him in 77 or 78, 77. I think it was 77. And by 80, 283, he had stepped into the position that I was in at that time, you know, moving around the country, speaking to all the immigrants, and they jumping up and down. Well, I eased out of that, and he stepped in, because it was my job to be over here, and it was job to be right there. So that's... Uh, I think we haven't done a bad job. Are there any more questions or comments? Yeah, there was a brother that asked, uh, who are the curly-headed crew? The curly-headed crew, is that, does he have a phone number or anything? Uh, no, it's just uh, their YouTube name is who who do you say that they are? Okay, the curly-headed crew. The curly-headed crew is Hashem Alauddin, uh, Brother Wali uh, Scott, whatever his name was, uh, and uh, Sister Zakia, you know, the sister that called every now and then? Okay. And uh, they were all from UC Berkeley. And uh, 
we will comment as time go on on each one of them's uh, position or condition now. But that's the curly-headed crew. Yep. They were, you know, mixed race. Uh, although Hashim is Japanese and, uh, and black and the other ones are Zakia's mama's white and her daddy was black. And I don't know who uh, Wali, Wali and look, they were married, in fact, Wali and Zakia was married. The lady that some kind, yeah, they was married. It's a long story, but anyway, I think they're all in a position to play as a good part in this step forward. Yeah, they're in a good position. Yeah, all of them. Uh, I don't know about Wally, but uh, the others, curly-headed crew. Yep, so I hope we name uh, people. Uh, yeah. Uh, any more questions or comments? Okay. Uh, I must, tomorrow's Juma, so I'm going to go over this. I'll go over the same thing Sunday, but in briefer uh, I'll go over it as a concept tomorrow in June. I don't want to get stuck on it. And then Sunday, and then again, maybe next Tuesday, because we have to, uh, there's too many pieces uh, uh, missing. Uh, there's too many pieces missing. Uh, so, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.